Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining us in the latest installment of the Ch Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Today, Kelly O'Neill and John Ladley will discuss keys to creating an analytics-driven culture. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DIAnalytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today. Kelly O'Neill is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners. Having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management, Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. John Lally is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management with 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. John frequently writes and speaks on a variety of technologies in EIM topics. His information management experience is balanced between strategic technology planning, project management, and practical application of technology to business problems. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello and Happy New Year to everyone. And Happy New Year from me as well. And I hope everyone is staying nice and warm because some of us uh, are Enduring some winter weather right now. Yeah, so. bracing in the storm, huh? Uh, you bet, you bet. And cold, anyway. Uh, well, we will warm people's hearts by talking about an analytics-driven culture. How's that? <laughs> better than chestnuts by an open fire. There you go. And today what we want to do is start to get practical also. So, you know, in line with the way that we try and uh, address these webinars is there's a lot of talk about an analytics-driven culture, a data-driven culture, and we want to go through some thoughts and concepts that help to make this a practical endeavor in your organization so that it's not just theory, that you walk away with some tools and techniques of things that you can do to embrace analytics uh, in an analytics-driven culture. As we go through that, we will do some level setting around analytics-driven versus data-driven. Um, and we'll talk about what culture is and why culture matters. And so how do we then tie the two together, engaging our key senior leaders and stakeholders, and look at how a vision statement can help to articulate and enlist those members of your organization uh, to participate in the analytics uh, program. We'll talk about some specific best practices for communications and uh, approaches uh, to drive the analytics culture, and then, of course, end with a few takeaways. All right. So I guess first off, when, when John and I were working on putting this together, we talked a lot about data-driven versus analytics-driven, and are they really the same? And we thought, you know what, there is a nuance that we want to start to clarify. Um, data-driven does get a lot of attention. Data-driven is ensuring that all participants within your organization, all of your data citizens, understand how important data is to your organization and how to uh, leverage or the organization's information infrastructure. But analytics-driven is also important, too, and it is a subset of data-driven. John, do you want to talk about the view of analytics-driven and, and how you see that as a nuance but an important delineation from data-driven? Yeah, it, and it is an important uh, nuance. Um, uh, uh, and I would say that um, when you're reading literature and you're seeing words like analytics-driven, and data-driven, a good way to, to not get a headache is consider analytics-driven more of a subset of data-driven, you know, because data-driven means that you are 
emphasizing a quantitative approach to things. So even if it's not analytics based, even if it's just a, a really good uh, business intelligence query, right? And it provides some insight to help operate an organization that is technically uh, data driven. Um, now analytics, where we're going in and looking at patterns and we're looking at something that uh, is, is predictive um, or, or prescriptive, in nature means we're adding another quality to our decision-making process. So not only are we looking at um, what happened historically, not only are we looking at um, um, uh, 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 reacting to obvious inputs that we're doing as management, but we're also adding this layer of prediction or prescription to our decision-making process. And that is where the analytics aspect comes in, and that's where the analytics aspect will layer over or or enter into the to this data-driven thinking. It's really important. This sounds like maybe we're dealing with, you know, how many camels on the head of a pin type philosophical things here, but it's actually really important because a lot of organizations um, uh, uh, um, are you know saying we're data driven we're data driven and really haven't taken the time to figure out what that means so some attention to the semantics here is is, is important um, back to you Kelly yeah and I would like to highlight this concept of the pattern also and so it's bringing in this visualization component to tr to create the story um, that is important from an analytics driven perspective all right well, with that clarity, we wanted to start our polling question. Shannon, are you ready? So question is, how would you rate your organization's culture related to its being analytics driven? So are you in Nirvana where you are analytics driven? Uh, is it still a work in progress? So you're on the path to Nirvana. Uh, are you not so analytics driven, <laughs> so you don't know where to begin, uh, or is this something that is just not part of the, the discussion in your organization um, because it's, it's potentially so far away from, from what you're currently doing? Um, all right, the Nirvana, work in progress with, clueless, or not sure? <laughs> Yep. Is this the part where, oh, I've only got three or four seconds now, so I won't sing the Jeopardy theme or anything there like we that. Go. And then the, the numbers should be coming in here um, uh, at any minute. Um, uh, my money is uh, on not sure how to answer or somewhere, uh, most answers in the latter half uh, there. Uh, well, there we go. There we go. Well, there we go. And Look I at was that. Wrong. So, yeah. So, I think that this is actually great in the sense that the largest percentage is, is saying work in progress. So 38% of you had indicated that you're on the path to having an analytics-driven culture. Uh, surprising, I think, to, to us, John, uh, but I think that's great. So that means that not only is there a recognition of the importance, but there is a process and a path that is, that is happening. Um, and John, maybe our goal for this year is to get that 54% of you all that don't respond to respond. So how yeah. can we make these questions more compelling? <laughs> yeah, I, well, we, 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 we thought about some type of, um, well, we kicked that one around. I, we're going to have to have some type of incentive here. I don't know. Exactly. Fabulous prizes. We'll have to come up with fabulous prizes. That's, <laughs> That's right. right. That's all there is to it. Okay. Excellent. Well, moving on. Anyway, thank you for those of you that do continue to participate. Uh, it does... I think give a, an understanding of where we are as an organ, as, as, a, as a community. Um, so we do appreciate your involvement and your participation. Um, so the other thing is, you know, it is the golden age of data. Um, I mean, I've been in workshops uh, with the clients for the last couple of days where we are talking about data, data protection, data privacy, the implications to the organization. It is a huge multifaceted priority for uh, many, many organizations. But we still see challenges. And so those, uh, I guess, you know, 38, uh, those 62% that aren't down the path quite yet are probably struggling with some of these same 
issues that we see in these different organizations. Um, it's you know technology driven, so we overbuy technologies but under deliver true value. Uh, we have data strategies and cannot execute on them. So these are these are things that we've heard from our peers in the industry, our clients, our would-be clients on what some of their challenges are. Um, John, any of these that you want to highlight that you've experienced uh, specifically? Uh, one, I'm starting to see a lot more than I have um, in prior years. It's something that's been in the back of mind, but that's the cost of ownership. Um, uh, um, and I, this is almost a, a, off our topic here, but your organization and most organizations are spending a lot more money than they have to on using data, and are spending a lot more money on analytics than they have to. And 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 the initial rush of there's two factors working towards that. One is the initial rush of the glorious technology and the cool stuff we can do with this stuff, which is kind of fun and, and neat. Uh, a second one is the internal cultures in this in this uh, um, uh, tendency towards uh, um, uh, functional areas to to do their own thing. Um, but organizations holistically don't realize really how much money they're spending on this. A few have started to go, wait a second, this is just kind of crazy. Um, and I'm, I, I, I sense a snowball here getting ready to head down the hill on, on, on that one. Um, and if you want to be data driven, that's fine. Um, where that applies, though, is you can't be data driven with every single functional area having its own VAs and its own tools and its own database. That's not data driven. We're not going there. I mean, yeah, some organizations say, well, we're data driven because everyone has data analysts and they do all their reports and they have all the self service and all that. That's not data driven because that's way, way, way too expensive. Uh, to, it's not sustainable. Just some organizations are figuring that out. Um, we may even have some more on that later on in the year here where you're going to, we might take a deeper dive into the, into this topic uh, later on. So anyway, that's my one I wanted to, to point out there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so some of these might be familiar to uh, the listeners on the line today. Um, you know, it is hard. It's not easy. And so those 38% that are down the path, they've gone down that path with probably a lot of scars. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about how to address at least the culture side of this and, and the, the culture side to ultimately address involvement, participation, and alignment around uh, improving data value and reducing that total cost of ownership. All right. Why, why does culture matter and what is culture? So, you know, culture is really the thought, the concept of the way we do things around here. And so it is that group of assumptions, beliefs, values, and behaviors that are uh, consistent across an organization. And it's the way that you hire people. It is the way that people create your success. Sometimes it is clearly articulated. So, you know, HubSpot, this is a great culture code because it's clear, it's written down, it's printed, it is visible, things like that. Other cultures might not be as visible from a documentation perspective, but are very visible from a behavior perspective. So Virgin Airlines. Uh, also, as we we're kind of rehearsing this, we we're talking about how fun it is to fly on a Virgin airplane. And it's such a different experience from any other travel that you have. So at Virgin, their mission is to embrace the human spirit and let it fly. Play on the words with fly, but they're really talking about spirit and that sort of thing. Um, REI, my favorite store in the whole wide world, um, their mission and vision is to inspire, educate, and outfit for a lifetime of outdoor adventure and stewardship. So again, it's ways of saying, you know, this is what our focus is. So whether our focus is flight and we want to embrace the human spirit and make it fun, et cetera, it does really inform the way that people behave in your company. And it doesn't always have to be written down in order to create a strong culture. And in fact, sometimes the culture has nothing, the true culture of an organization has nothing to do with what is written down. So again, we want to make sure that we aren't just talking about culture as a documentation process, but truly a way to get people on board with what you would like to aspire to have as a culture. 
and what you want to see as an analytics-driven culture. So as we go through this webinar today, we will go from this highest level in terms of what is culture and why is it important, and then get down into how do we make it a reality and how do we ensure that the way that people behave and the way that things are done around analytics in the organization matches what you're trying to accomplish and what you document from a vision statement. So as we're thinking about creating that culture, this is about behaviors. And within an organization, especially when we're on kind of the data side of the organization, we think a lot about results. We think a lot about metrics. We think a lot about, um, you know, what are we actually getting at the end result? And we want to drive towards that result. But the reality is, and, and what, uh, um, that has, what we have seen in terms of uh, uh, experiments and um, investigations and just our own uh, engagement with clients is that if you don't address how people think about what they're trying to accomplish, their beliefs, then you don't optimize the results. Because realistically, people behave not only in an analytical way, but they combine that analytical process with their belief system. And that is how they ultimately behave. And that's how it's manifested in the culture. So I did adapt this from um, uh, a presentation that I saw by a guy named Dan Barnett, who's a wonderful speaker. And he talks about this as being the result force. And the result force is engaging people from their belief perspective, which engages their limbic system, their fight or flight, their core kind of uh, uh, animal brain, if you will. So engaging their belief system so that then when they combine that belief with their analytical neocortex, uh, data-driven or analytic-driven um, understanding, then you will get the results that you're looking for. And that that is really what drives the culture of the organization. And by getting people aligned around beliefs and behaviors, you can create a consistent culture. And through creating consistent cultures and co consistent behavior, you will get the results that you're looking for. So the idea is, yes, you need to identify those results that you want, uh, the, uh, the metrics that you want to create, the impact to the organization, et cetera. But in order to get those results, let's not forget that we are dealing with people. And therefore, we need to engage their belief system and ensure that we are talking about the importance of an analytics-driven culture in a way that their belief system can adopt and align themselves with. And uh, that, I think, is a really important concept. So what we're talking about in the rest of the presentation is really getting to drive to this belief, getting people to rally around beliefs, rally around visions, rally around um, uh, goal, um, a purpose of why we are driving towards analytics so that we can then get the results that we're looking for. So this flow of starting with beliefs in order to drive results is a foundation for some of the rest of the presentation. Um, John, did you want to add any color here or some of your experience in which you've seen strong cultures either created or um, exploded? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, the, the key with a, a you know a culture, um, uh, all cultures all, almost by definition are strong because it is the way an organization does its things. The 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 key to moving towards data driven is understanding um, how heavily your culture is is hung up on the belief and behavior thing, which is where you get the we've always done it that way. Uh, problem, right, um, versus starting to be a more thinking organization and and applying a, a, a quantitative uh, filter uh, to your decisions and, and your actions. Um, this is the reason that uh, we, we already have one question that came in here, and I'll, 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 I can answer it uh, at this slide. Uh, a lot of people complain about data silos. Um, this is where your silos uh, entrench themselves because this is where they believe that no one else can do it as good as they can. 
um, their behaviors are geared that way. And to get them to break out of that is a major behavioral shift. Um, and this is a very human, uh, to reinforce Kelly's point, this is a very human psychological problem. A lot of folks will say, well, that's politics. That's politics. It's not politics. It might have been politics to start, but once it's entrenched, it is now behavioral. And, and, and it takes some work. Uh, it really takes some work to get there. So um, uh, you got to keep, keep this picture in mind as we go forward, really. And I think it's important to think if we want to get people moving beyond the it's always been done this way, we need to change that belief. We need to change that, you know, foundational construct of this is the only way that it can be done. So what needs to happen in order to change the way that that core belief and the way that their system is engaged in order to behave in a way that leverages all of that great data and analytics that we're shooting for? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into the how. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Okay, so uh, supportive executive is the first. Everyone talks about that. Um, uh, a good sponsor, someone with buy-in, and I'm going to do two right off the bat. I'm going to tell you that those are um, not deep enough. Um, a supportive executive is a lot more than just bought in. Um, uh, um, you know, they understand and articulate the what and why. The key there is the articulate of, of something. So if you're going to be analytics driven, you have a supportive executive that is very, very articulate at why this is really important and how to do it. Um, uh, and then perseverance. In other words, a lot of people are not going to understand what, what's going on. Uh, you know, you talk one and here is here is the results of a Monte Carlo simulation, right? And it tells us to uh, to turn this way in the marketplace. You know, half your meeting is going to be uh, wondering what is that and why do I I need to pay attention to this? So now we're going we're getting into this picture I told you to keep in mind earlier, uh, and now people begin to get nervous. Um, the visible support is kind of obvious. Uh, accountability. It's also kind of obvious, uh, um, um, uh, in other words, if, if you are going to be data-driven, then you've got to tie incentives and activities to, to that. Um, and is the advocate for overcoming the resistance? And, of course, you, it goes without saying you have to be an effective communicator here. We are seeing a lot of people in charge of these types of initiatives that have not been trained properly to be a true supporter of this type of program. We are, we, and this even goes up to the chief data officer or the chief analytics officer. They might be a tremendous data person, a PhD in mathematics, a tremendous statistical uh, engineer, um, uh, and they are um, uh, abysmal, quite frankly, at rallying the troops to, 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 to follow this. And so the things just kind of fall off, off by uh, fall off by uh, the wayside. There has to be an emotional connection. And unfortunately, a lot of the personality types that get into heavy analytics and heavy prescriptive and predictive are tend to be mathematical in orientation and not uh, folks that are used to having to engage this way. And they need to be trained that way. Just hiring a very capable data scientist and making them in charge of a program uh, there's no, nowhere near a guarantee of success here, um, uh, and that's not your supportive executive. You might have to have another executive actually being the sponsor uh, of where, whatever the analytics officer is trying to accomplish. Um, you know, the key here is to increase engagement, and that's on the next uh, slide. Um, here, I'm sorry, Kelly, anything to add to that one before I ask you to pop to the, to, to the next one? No, I just wanted to uh, reiterate one of the things that you said is that not every executive knows how to be supportive. So I think one of the things that we need to think about as, as a team is supporting our executives also, educating them on what it means to be supportive, giving them ideas on what they need to do, being specific, helping them understand what their role is and why their role is also important to the program. Yeah. Uh, so here, this is kind of a, with that 
a couple of charts ago, I said keep that in mind. Keep this one in mind too. Mm -hmm. There, there. I have a little saying um, when I, whenever I'm with a bunch of uh, new folks that are new to this, and they say, "Oh, we have buy-in," and 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 that's just something I just say to myself to 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 uh, ground the enthusiasm, to make it um, to channel the energy of the group, and that is that buy-in tends to be bogus. All right. Um, Buy-in just means that you vocally support something. But where on this curve of engaging in a change in an organization is buy-in? Buy-in is between awareness and understanding and a positive perception. That's where buy-in occurs. Well, buy-in is in nowhere near uh, w the activities that you need to institutionalize and internalize something new. So, and that's why a lot of artists say, so boy, we had buy-in, but our sponsor never shows up. Well, your sponsor, you had buy-in, but buy-in's not what you want. What you need is engagement, okay? So the key here is to actually move people through these steps. You need a plan to do that. So with awareness, you know, contact is, hello, how are you? I'm so-and-so in -so this, and we want to be data-driven. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying this for the sake of our, 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 our event here. Um, here's the concepts. Um, here's what it means to you. Um, does that sound like a good idea? They go thumbs up. Yes, now you have positive perception. Now here's how we have to get it adopted by the organization. So now you need to understand what's going to happen when you go from that, from that limbic behavior to the neocortex behavior. What is your organization going to do? If you're deeply siloed, you're going to have an enormous amount of resistance. And you're going to have to move it silo by silo by silo to get the adoption. And that's going to be one battle at a time. And you know what? There is no way I can make that easier. That is what you have to do. There is no magic formula there, you know, other than the CEO uh, or in firm counsel writing a letter that the government has said through some vast new regulation to change everything overnight. Those are the only things that will get people to turn on a dime. Other than that, it's going to be a department at a time. But eventually, Eventually, you will be able to recognize and measure that people have made this behavior their own behavior and say, well, of course, I've always felt that way. That's when you know you've made it. Um, you have to formally move folks up, up uh, this curve. Remember that buy-in can be bogus, okay? It can be misdirecting. Some discussion points. Uh, Kelly, anything to add to that? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just think that, you know, this is this is kind of an upward curve, right? And so the idea is that the the purpose is to increase the engagement. And we bring this up during the executive stakeholder discussion because for your executive stakeholders, they should be going one direction on this curve and they should be at a target state of the institutionalization, meaning they understand and they know what it means that analytics driven is just how we do business and then they should also internalize what it means to them personally to their own group their own division and how it helps push the business forward so that it is so that you have involved them and they do believe that it should be an analytics driven culture because they are a wonderful voice for the uh, analytics program to ensure that they are extending their belief, convincing other people, evangelizing why analytics driven is important. So this is key to think about getting those uh, executives along the path to not just adoption, but institutionalization and, and internalization of, the, of their beliefs. Okay. So how do we do that? What's a way yeah. to do that, John? Well, um, you need to train your leaders, um, and then you need to measure them. So, uh, what we addressed to what we addressed earlier were the characteristics. So, a leader needs to be uh, either hired to be able to articulate and rally the troops, et cetera, et cetera, that we talked about. And then they need to be assessed along the way. Um, th what we have here is a sample from uh, a battery of questions that we think that leaders need to learn. So when we train a sponsor or or um, the change agent of a data-driven or analytics-driven initiative, they need to be very clear about answering these questions. I'm not going to go through every one, 
uh, you can uh, review this and screen capture it and, and all that uh, later on. But you know, well, how does the analytic strategy contribute to vision and business strategy? If they can't sit down and say in a very concise manner, this is kind of your elevator speech you'll hear about once in a while, you know, we are doing predictive analytics so we can do X and Y, right? And th if they can't do that specifically and not wander off into some exotic co uh, conversation about data science and big data and stuff like that, then, you know, if they have to wander off in that big discussion, they're not well enough trained yet. Um, same thing with the major issues. They've got to understand what their obstacles are. How can you move up that curve on the prior slide if you don't understand what those obstacles are? It's, it is absolutely unrealistic to ask any type of leader to, to move an organization from its current state to a future state with, with, without understanding what those major issues are going to be. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, you can't say, well, deal with them as they pop up, which a lot of CEOs say. All right, and that, you know, you need that, that's copying out. All right, that means, you know, you've got to kind of think these things through. Um, again, what will be different? Of all those questions, you know, if, you know, when you look at your role and accountability and all of those things, I think if you're going to answer one question, Kelly, and this is something that we ask all the time, what will be different? You know, we're going to hire the this consultant, we got a new consultant on staff, his name's Harry Potter, all right? Harry Potter comes in, does a spell, you know, information aliamas or something like that. Boom, you've got all the infrastructure, all the tools, all the metadata, all the sharp data scientists you have. Leaders, tell me what's different about this organization now. What's happened to the balance sheet? What's happened to the income statement, all right? If you can reach that point, now you're on the way. That's, those are the kind of things to, so if you want to know how you do this, be able to answer that question explicitly. Anything to add to that, Kelly? Yeah, just, we also use this as an exercise to compare across how different executives view the analytics program. And so whether you use all eight questions, you reduce it down to three or four, the idea is by asking each of the leaders those same set of questions, you can start to identify consistencies as well as gaps. Because if you've got two executives who are potentially in a you know, leadership committee, one of them may be the identified sponsor, but the other one is on the committee and they have an influence. If they have different viewpoints on any of these questions, then that's going to impact your ability to drive to consistency and to really draw, create the analytics culture because their viewpoint of what does it mean uh, would be different. So I think this is an important question list for your executive sponsor, but also across that leadership team. So um, food for thought. Yep. We have another so instrument coming up here. Oh, yeah, there we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> so now we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, other sorts of stakeholders within the organization. Um, so, John, did you want to go through this stakeholder guide? So these are these would be kind of your non-executive stakeholders, and we want yeah, to delineate and, uh, slightly. Go ahead. Yeah, and 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 again, this is just um, uh, again, this is something you can screen cap if you want to, you know, go through this again, uh, call up the, the the recording of this uh, and all that. Um, and that is. Uh, um, um, you know, first of all, understand what a stakeholder is, um, and it's not anyone that has a stake in it, right? That's the cheeseburger definition. But it's someone who's going to be affected or job's role will be affected by this uh, uh, data-driven initiative or analytics-driven initiative, which in some organizations could be almost everybody, right? Then what's their role in that? You know, it, since they are affected, how are how is how are they affected? What's their role? How will they stand out in this activity? Then you get to predict how they're going to react. Remember, I said, uh, and, and going back to what Kelly, I said, keep that picture in mind that Kelly went through about what drives culture. Um, uh, uh, I, I jokingly tell people once in a while, this is where you get to gossip about people. You know, if you, you know, if you did this to so and so, how are they going to react? Um, and they go, well, they're going to hate that. Perfect. That's just what we want to hear. You know, then we can work with that, right? Um, uh, wh why will they react that way? What are they worried about? And then 
What do we need from them? And then how should we get them on board? So these seem like really logical questions, but you actually, again, you need to have a formal, uh, you know, we have a formal organization change management practice in First San Francisco. We, we have uh, uh, engineered this uh, um, because you have to. Uh, you can't just do this extemporaneously. We have to ask these questions or we'll, we'll miss people, we'll miss personalities, we'll, we'll miss some of the challenges and things like that. So the next thing is with everybody, I want you to have your leaders on board, now you have to understand your, your stakeholders. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, Kel, stop here, let Kelly weigh in, and then the next slide, we'll, uh, we'll, Kelly will launch off on the uh, engagement strategy that, uh, that we work with here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you can see kind of as the questions go left to right that they become very tactical and this should inform your planning. Um, there, This does translate into activity. So this does translate into project deliverables and that sort of thing. So understanding what you need from a stakeholder and then determining how to work with them, those should be recorded within the project plan. So I know that analytics our programs, their ongoing disciplines, entities, et cetera, but things are delivered in a series of projects. And so there needs to be time allocated for getting what you need from a stakeholder because generally it's not just a single email. Many times there's a lot more effort associated with that. And also engaging with that stakeholder does take time and should be allocated for uh, that level of relationship management and communication is extraordinarily important and needs to be accounted for. And so the reason that we think about this is because there are only a few, well, there are only a certain number of hours in the day. There's a lot to do, and it is important to allocate your time across those that stakeholder community appropriately. Otherwise, you will uh, not be optimizing those hours that are spent with the different stakeholders. So unlike the idea that the stakeholder marches is nicely on this upward sloping curve, the reality is, is many people don't. And you will come across stakeholders within your program that in fact go backwards or jump off the curve, <laughs> right? So we want to make sure that we're identifying how we engage with them based on their ability to influence the success of the program and the impact of the program to them. So if we think about this as a, as a quadrant, and we have stakeholder influence going up the left-hand side and impact or interest in the program across the bottom, that stakeholder interest can be uh, thought of also as how does the, how does the program impact them. Uh, maybe they're a consumer of the analytics output. Maybe they, are, uh, they feed uh, information or they structure information that feeds into the analytics um, program. So that, that would be their their involvement or interest. And the idea is that you want to plot those stakeholders across these quadrants to prioritize them. So do they have a lot of influence and do they have a lot of interest in the program so therefore they're a key player? If they are, we put them in the upper right quadrant. Maybe they don't have a lot of organizational influence but they've got a lot of interest. Well, we wanna make sure that we're showing consideration and fostering that interest as well. Those folks that have a lot of interest in the, uh, or have a lot of influence in the organization, but don't actually have a lot of interest. In fact, maybe these are your obstacles, or these are people who are fighting you for budget. You still need to meet their needs because guess what? If they're influential in the organization, they may actually influence a key player, and you don't want a key player's interest level to start to wane either. So by plotting the different stakeholders on this uh, quadrant, you can formulate a plan on how to the, engage with them. Uh, how do they fit into the uh, communication process? Um, do you work with them individually? Who influences who? So sometimes you wanna start mapping lines of influence. And if you know that some of the people that are in the meet their needs category uh, have a great influence on one of the key players, you want to be aware of that and incorporate that into your planning accordingly. Um, so this is a good way to prioritize activities around stakeholders and make sure that you are 
managing those stakeholders in the most efficient and effective level based on their ability to drive success or impact success of your program. Anything you want to add to this, John? No, no, that's uh, well done. <laughs> that <one amazing. laughs> Great, all right. Well, so uh, those are some ideas around stakeholder management. So now let's talk a little bit about the visioning process. So vision statements are images of the desired future, rich, inspirational, evocative, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea is that that vision statement is what inspires and starts to impact the belief of your stakeholders and your community um, in general. Because that vision statement should be the emotional part of it that, that starts to articulate the importance of the program. And so, you know, here's a sample. So data and information will be our main driver of organic growth. Data must enable the easy measurement of ROI allowing for application of advanced analytics. So one could argue this is long, absolutely, and but the idea is that you want to start talking about importance to the organization. So growth of the organization, uh, measurement of um, programs and projects, and allowing for application of advanced analytics. So what this says is that this organization, they're trying to move more into the sophisticated and a uh, really advanced level of analytics as opposed to doing more simplified uh, um, analysis processes. Mm -hmm. Any any of the vision statement or even the process to get to a vision statement? Well, uh, well, the, the process, you know, vision statements or vision statements, you can you can find a thousand ways to, you know, facilitate a room full of people to get to a vision statement. But remember that you're building this vision around data driven and analytics driven. What does that mean to your organization? So the process to get there is fairly conventional. The result might be earth shaking. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, just to have everyone read that first sentence in that vision. Data and information will be our main driver of organic growth. Now we we do a lot of work with a lot of companies and and we don't make much of this stuff up. These things are always, right, Kelly, they're kind of boiled down from real examples that we've genericized or, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and we have worked with three organizations in the last year where their vision statement had something to say along these lines. Um, one of them is doing pretty darn well. The other two uh, uh, adopted this as a vision threw it out to the management team, and the management team immediately spun off into the ditch because they had no idea how to switch their main driver of organic growth, which just was get more customers, right? Or lower overhead in their area. Or, or you know, in some companies just buy back stock so the stock price goes up. Now all of a sudden you have this sea change of, of vision. Uh, bumping up against whatever the corporate vision is. So this is a really important exercise to do. You might want to say something like this, but your organization might in no way, shape, or form be ready to handle anything like this, and you're going to have to back away from that. So the person that's driving being data-driven or, 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 you know, even if it's a CEO, um, the CEO needs to be told, right, that you can't say this unless you're really ready to do it. You know, think about what that one sentence could mean to a lot to, to your organization, those of you that are listening to this. Think of what that would mean if that if all of a sudden your data was your main engine of of growth and you and you and and you're all the people that send in the questions about data silos, you're probably going now and hey, that wouldn't work, right? So, you know, again, um, the, it's not so much the vision statement, but an analytics-driven vision statement, really, really important because that will encapsulate and set the principles out there that you will follow as, as you move forward uh, with, with your analytics-driven efforts. Absolutely. So let's just put that into context a little bit. So the vision statement is really kind of the first step in this process. And so this is a five-step process to 
create a communication and a way to align an organization around an analytics-driven culture. And so you're absolutely right, John. You can't just start, stop at a vision statement and create a vision statement that has nothing behind it. And the idea is that this framework both helps to create the communication around what are we doing about making that vision a reality, and it forces the thought process in the conversation around how do we fill it out in the sense that you can have a vision. The vision also needs to be supported by a purpose, and that purpose is why are you executing the vision? What is the impact to the organization that that vision uh, will have once it's achieved? And then what does the picture of the future state look like? What will we have accomplished? How will behaviors be different? Uh, what are we expecting to see as a result? And this starts to evoke what people can internalize in terms of something that is uh, visual, and they start to see how will the future be different than the current, and of course, how will it be better because we've articulated the, the purpose. Now, to get more tactical, then that picture, there is a plan that supports that. That plan is what the organization needs to do in order to create that analytics program. And the plan could be a strategy document, a roadmap, uh, a project plan. So depending upon where you are in building out your goals, that plan can be either high level or very strategic. But it needs to be good enough to articulate to people this is our vision, what we're trying to do, why it's important, what the future will look like, and this is how we're going to get there. So the vision needs to be supported with the how. And then the participation, which is who is involved, what is your role in the program, et cetera. And you can see here that the vision and the purpose are uh, targeting the belief component of that results force so that you can really get people to change their belief around why this is important to the organization. And then the picture plan and participation starts to drive to the exact behavior that you're looking for in order to get to the result. So this is just a framework to create a communication structure, but also to create a decision making and a planning process so that it is uh, effective and it can be implemented and it's not just an empty vision statement. John, anything to add before I go to the next slide? Uh, because of the delay in unmuting, no. <laughs> okay, great. And we're just, we want to make sure we're also leaving time for questions. I think yeah. in our end of year uh, um, webinar, we really came up to the end. So apologize to the group for that. Um, so this all leads into the communication process. So that vision purpose, picture, participation is the content, but then there's the whole process to communicate it out. And so the communication plan is a really important component of your overall uh, analytics program and your overall analytics planning process. Um, again, it is time consuming. There is effort associated with it. There is collaboration and coordination associated with it. And so it is important to account for it. Uh, in your planning process. And it is an uh, easy thing to leave off the, the plan, but it is important to allocate time, energy, resources, and therefore uh, financial um, funding towards it. Uh, so just a, key, a few things on this. Um, always start it early. Um, more communication, the better. Um, recognize that there is value in repeating. The more you repeat your vision, the more people will start to recognize it uh, understand it, ask questions about it, and hopefully internalize it. Remember to customize your messages by your stakeholder group, because what is meaningful to one organization or one per individual person is not going to be meaningful to another person or another uh, um, part of the organization. And this is also where communications can become time consuming and needs to be allocated for in terms of your planning because that customization of messaging is very time consuming. And then, of course, don't be afraid to test your messages to make sure that they are resonating with your stakeholder groups in the way that you do want them to resonate. Um, 
John, anything to add? Yeah, real quick. Com communications plans are yeah. plans. They're meant to be executed. Um, I don't know how many people will call up a year after we're, we're there and we'll say, how's it going? And I'll go, oh, we're having trouble with all of this. And I go, yeah, your communication plan. And they get it on and go, so which events have you done? Well, we only did like the kickoff meeting. Well, okay, follow your communication plan. Try it. Because, I mean, the worst that's going to happen is you're going to push, you're going to bump into some resistance and someone will tell you to slow down. But, a lot, you know, communication plan is meant to be executed, not just done. It's just something I've been picking up here in the last six months that, I mean, well, you know, we do it and they you read it and they approve it and they go, yay. And then, and then it says, have a big event in six weeks and the event never happens. Well, okay. Well, why'd we do the plan? You know, so you got how to, you, you know, execute the plan. Uh, that's just, that's, that, right. that's not so much additional material. That's more like advice. Sorry to sound like your dad, but that's advice, right? <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. And we mentioned this in one of the bullet points is that you need to speak to the language of your stakeholder. And so many times I'm translating what you see from a data value perspective into. And this is really important because what you are tracking and measuring from a data perspective in terms of quality metrics, uh, redundancy, you know, speeds and feeds, um, uh, you know, number of reports, number of algorithms, et cetera, meaningful to that business person. What they're going to care about is uh, how have you helped me push my business forward? Because you've rationalized my customer base, I'm better able to execute marketing campaigns and my hit rate has increased significantly. Um, because you have uh, provided me with the uh, appropriate segmentation for this uh, customer base, I'm able to launch my new product more quickly. So this is the way where you translate the data and analytics uh, components into value statements for your business. Very important to do that. Um, anyway, in the interest of time, let's just go quickly to some approaches here. John, did you want to share some examples? Yeah, we had, um, uh, here's where, you know, the, the first organization transitioned to, uh, um, uh, analytics driven started out with the sandbox and the sandbox was actually buried in a business area um, the organization was not one to embrace uh, uh, new technology things um, lots of reasons for that uh, a deadly soup of uh, IT doesn't get things done um, some of it was true some of it was not true as well as the what I call the hero culture of someone learning uh, Excel and, and doing a heroic report or something like that. So at any rate, this organization not into a big centralized uh, data science program. So they started with a sandbox in a business area and some visible results came out and it made some for some profitable uh, actions, but they advertised those and they said, look what this data can do. Now, there was immediately some antagonism because IT said, well, it's our data, you know, we're the data folks, why are you doing this? We have a data warehouse, all this kind of stuff. And this other group says, we're not doing this to make you look bad, we're doing this because we did really cool things with data. So um, what, what they did was they intercepted this antagonism and started to force themselves up this engagement curve to get everybody thinking together. And that meant building out you know, stuff we've talked about before in this uh, series, uh, data governance. And, and they had stakeholder training and they had sponsorship training. And uh, you had a bunch of folks say, I don't need to go to training. I am the second or third in charge in the organization. Oh no, you do have to go. You know, have you ever implemented a data-driven culture before? Show that to me on your resume. No, okay, well then there's gonna be some training here, all right. Um, and we, they're working through these organizational changes. And another one is a, uh, shift gears to manufacturing. And manufacturing companies tend to be somewhat entrenched in how they do things. Um, but, uh, you know, along comes Internet of Things. And all of a sudden, data is everywhere. And data does become a potential source of organic growth. Um, here, you know, formal organization change management had to occur. Um, 
uh, data governance and business alignment became a buzzwords day in, day out in the vocabulary of everybody in this organization uh, because they were, uh, and, and gradually they internalized that the next wave of organic growth in their industry was not just making bigger machines that they were already making or better machines that they were making, but doing stuff with the data that those machines were generating. And, and that's- So guys, I just think we're at five minutes to the top of the hour. We can get to Q&A for the folks. That's okay, right. Dope. So let's just quickly, so um, John, do you want to just take 30 seconds and go through this slide? I'm, we'll I'm happy. That? This is, I will just go through the orange boxes, all right? All companies have business strategies. There's two business strategies there. Those strategies must, in an analytics-driven organization, those strategies are enabled by analytics. And you can see their analytics is a subset of, of data-driven, which is a subset of overall EIM or data management. So analytics have to be supported by managed data, which has to be of quality of data suitable for the task at hand that has to be governed and certified. So for someone to say, well, just because we are, we're doing data analytics, we, that means we don't need data governance or data quality. That's, that doesn't stick. That, that, that will not hold together over time. We use this chart a lot to kind of show people that this is an integrated problem that organizations have to deal with. And that was almost exactly 30 seconds. Let's go on Excellent. to uh, All that's right. my, my so, top 40 training showing up there. So. <laughs> so what can we do about it? All right. So we've broken this down in terms of what can you do in 2018. So as a senior leader, understand what it means to be a good sponsor. As a manager or a team lead, you can clarify your meaning, translate that analytic into action. So as a team lead, you can get your team moving and you can start to communicate upward all the good work that they're doing and you can also empower them uh, in order to deliver that work. Uh, the sharing of the stories is really critical at that level up to your senior leadership. Individual contributors, you have a huge role to play in all of this because if you don't share your stories and your successes, who's ever going to know about them? So tell your manager, your team lead, get an audience with your senior leaders so that you can communicate your successes and uh, share the lessons learned. And then of course, everyone can educate themselves about what is analytics? What are some of the successes out there? What are some of the changes that, they, that organizations have seen as a result of well-executed programs? And think about how can you bring something to the table that helps your organization move forward in 2018? Q&A. <laughs> yes. Kelly, I'll ask the question. You take the first shot. We've got uh, uh, several questions, but there are, two, there are two themes. So first of all, the cost and return of a data program. So you're going to be analytics driven, you're going to be data driven. How do I do the ROI? That's the yeah, first Yeah, and so this, absolutely, and I saw this question come in, and um, hi Tony, nice to, to hear from you. The uh, This is a really big question, and I'm trying to think if we had any webinars in the past where we explicitly yes, we have. went through yes, application we have. of cost yes. and return. Okay. So, yes, so uh, I'm going to um, maybe, Shannon, on our follow-up, we can send some links to those webinars. Um, and those might be great resources to answer this question, uh, at least from a first step and from a second step, uh, we can spend some time with you uh, in a more detailed way. But really it is um, looking specifically at productivity, um, enhancing uh, the way that people get to uh, um, get questions, answers, get, get reports generated, um, execute operational efficiency. And there's one other thing, I will, I'm gonna add one other thing to it. Pretend that you that your next source of organic growth is what you're doing with your data. And there and then use the same exact calculations you do if you were doing the ROI on a new product or a new service or a new business. All right. Do it exactly the same way. Just pretend you're going to monetize your data. And that exercise right there will get you 40% down the road before the rest of the other metrics that our other talks have talked about. So change a mindset and do an experiment. And, that, and then, then we'll, so the next question is, um, uh, 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 executives use analytics and data-driven as buzzwords, but the organization decisions are not in line with the buzzwords. How do we deal with that? Kelly, you can take a crack at that and then we'll finish up. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so then that chart that we talked about just a couple of slides ago, the one that, you know, how analytics driven, data driven, and data management are aligned. So that sort of flow or line of sight is a good way to start to link other decisions, other organizational projects, programs, and identify how they can and potentially cannot support analytics. So there's many instances in which organizational decisions uh, conflict with the analytics program. And part of having a um, kind of cross-functional uh, group of guides or, you know, call it a steering committee can help identify where those conflicts arise. And that's also a place in which your senior executive and stakeholder can start to be your advocate and break down barriers and identify where those organizational decisions are not in line with it and identify how to get them in line or what can we do to manage that conflict because sometimes it's an appropriate conflict. Uh, John, did you want to add to that? No, I think that was really good. And uh, uh, in the interest of time, um, uh, Kelly, unless you have anything else, I'll just we can just turn this back over to Shannon. Thank you. That's good. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you both for kicking off the new year with such a great topic. And thanks to all of our attendees for being, uh, for attending and for being engaged in everything we do. We just loved it. And just, we hope you can join us next month when we discuss the very hot topic of, uh, data, simplifying data lake and modern BI architecture. I know that's going to be a really good one. Uh, so, and I hope, uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Monday for this presentation with links to the slides, links to the recording, and in uh, all the additional information. So I'll try, I'll include a link into the past webinars as well for you all. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, John and Kelly, and thanks to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.